completeness sake go through some of the details. So, um, Dr. Van der Merwe referred to the fact that you get different uh, types of colposcopes. Some of them have a single lens um, and some of them have binocular vision. And the advantage of a binocular um, colposcope is that you can get an idea um, of topography, so you get a bit of depth of field, which you don't get with a, with a video colposcope. So if you want to, um, and if you have the ability to buy and choose your own colposcope, um, I think just have a look at both and see what is best for you, but the binocular um, scope gives you a much better um, stereoscopic vision. Um, and then obviously the other thing is, is a good light. So the anatomy of a colposcope includes the head of the colposcope, which contains all the optics. Um, and then obviously a stand is important, and you will only know how important that stand is, is if you have a bad stand. Um, so if you get a rep to come and sell your colposcope, um, buy the best stand that you can afford, because if the stand is a little bit unstable, you won't be seeing properly. And you will know in our clinic many of the colposcopes are actually fixed to the bed, but you, don't, you might not have that luxury. And then at the pink arrow you see the light source. Depending on the light source, you might need to do, um, uh, you can either switch it off immediately or you need to have it cooled down if it's an old fashioned um, bulb. The optic, uh, optics of a colposcope consists um, of a, a few components. So the eyepieces you'll see as at the, and at the end of the um, uh, uh, eyepieces, there's a diopter dial. Um, so in the morning when you get there, at the beginning of the clinic, put it onto zero, and you will know if you have special eyes, if you have maybe a plus two in the one eye and a minus one in the other eye, you can, you can do, do the settings yourself. Um, but often these are not sort of set to zero and then you can't see properly in focus. So do that before you start and then you'll see this magnification knob. Every colposcope has a different magnification. It can go anywhere from 4 to about 60. And then somewhere there will be a, a green filter um, that you can either engage or not. Um, and that will give you a much better idea of the blood vessels. So. As I said in the beginning of the morning, put it onto zero at the eyepieces so that you can um, adjust it for your own eyes. Um, we've actually discussed most of it. Oh, and the focal length is important. So on the lens itself, there's usually a focal length, uh, length and you can speak to Willi how to read that, but it's usually on most uh, colposcopes, it's the 30 centimeters. So the base distance between the colposcope and the cervix is usually about 30 centimeters. It can be 45 or 60, depending on the lens that's on the front of the colposcope. Um, but that will also help you to determine how far the colposcope must be approximately away from the, um, from the patient. And that is the, the diopter settings I'm talking about on the, on the eyepieces. Um, okay, then most colposcopes will have a fine focus um, knob and we've got actually one very nice colposcope in the clinic um, that you can focus very well. But that will only work if your colposcope is on a proper stand or if it's fixed to the, to the bed. The light source, depending on what type of light source you use, um, if it's an old-fashioned light source, um, there will be a fan that cools the bulbs. And that means you can't really switch that colposcope off immediately. You need to allow it to cool down the bulb before you switch it off, otherwise the bulb will last um, very short and those bulbs are extremely expensive. Many of the colposcopes have a fiber optic cable and if that cable breaks it will cost you 35,000 rand to buy a new fiber optic cable. So make sure that you don't twist it around the colposcope. Um, make sure that everything is nice and free at the end of the, of the day. So the, the light source can look something like this. Um, the, the fiber optic cable is breakable, so be careful. Um, and then the, the, that switch you probably won't use in the clinic. While you're busy with a colposcopy, you, you switch it on in the morning and you leave it on for the entire clinic. And you can turn that knob on and off in between patients if you want. And then at the end of the clinic, turn the light down completely and wait three minutes before you switch it off. Otherwise, your bulbs will not last very long. Um, so the history of colposcopy, it was described even before cytology, which is interesting. 
Um, and the idea was to do screening with colposcopy. Um, Hans Hinzelmann um, described it first in Germany. And in, in general, the applications for colposcopy would be as a screening tool, which is not used anymore um, in South Africa at least. Um, as a diagnostic aid, it helps us to determine the severity of a lesion and to facilitate treatment. Um, so if you look at the cervix um, without any stains, you get a good um, picture on the right top. Um, that was just after application of saline. The green filter will show you um, abnormal blood vessels. Many of the images will be better explained later on. After application of acetic acid, you might see um, uh, some of the lesions better. Um, and after Lewis iodine, um, you'll get a, 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 a okay. So my, my um, order of my slides is a bit uh, wrong now. So when will you refer somebody to colposcopy? But I think Jenny will also speak about this, or not really. Currently, in our current policy, um, if a nursing sister sees something that looks like a cancer, she can refer the patient directly to colposcopy. Um, she doesn't have to wait for the results of the cytology. If you have any cytology currently with a high-grade lesion, or an agus, atypical glandular cells of unknown significance, or if a cytology shows invasive carcinoma, that patient goes direct to colposcopy, and we prioritize these patients. They get a quicker appointment at the colposcopy clinic than somebody with a low-grade lesion. If you have two repeated low-grade lesions or an ascus, the patient also goes to colposcopy. Um, and if a patient has repeated inadequate smears, um, in private practice, there's a lot of um, triaging happening. So if a patient had a low-grade smear, um, many of the private laboratories now do reflex testing with an HPV test. And if you have a high-risk HPV test positive, then that patient gets referred to colposcopy. If you have primary HPV screening, which we don't do yet in South Africa, um, the recommendation is that anybody with a type 16 or 18 should be referred immediately to colposcopy. Um, and currently, um, the other high-risk types, types 31, 33, 45, and the rest, um, is in a sort of a, a um, if you look at the traffic light and there's a red category, they go to colposcopy. The other high-risk types is sort of in this yellow light category. So many people say you can repeat it once, and if it's positive, then they need to be referred. So. How do we use colposcopy currently in our system? Traditionally, the way it used to be done was that the patient will get a screening cytology smear. She would then be referred to the colposcopy clinic. In our days, as a registrar, you would do maybe four patients on a day, and you would spend an hour on each patient, and you would first do a biopsy to confirm the abnormality before the patient is recalled a month or six weeks later to come and get a treatment. What we're trying to do now is to take out this middle step of the biopsy. So your colposcopy is extremely important because you have a screening test and at this colposcopy visit you want to confirm that this is actually a lesion that needs treatment um, and we need to be fairly accurate to predict high grade lesions. And we are fairly good at that because if you look at our um, Pathology specimens, and most of them show that they've got underlying high-grade lesions. So some people would say, if you have an abnormal smear, why not just do a let straight away? Why, don't we, why do we need to do colposcopy? Um, and I want to argue we do need colposcopy um, for, for a few reasons. If you have a screening test that's abnormal, abnormal, you want to exclude cancer, and sometimes you can see that clearly on colposcopy. And if you have cancer, on colposcopy, you would manage the patient differently. You would either do a cold knife cone or you might actually refer the patient immediately to, to staging investigations. Um, and it's also, if we want to skip that middle step of doing a biopsy and confir confirming the high-grade abnormality, this is sort of to confirm the screen abnormality, to actually see that it's physically there. Um, you might use it to diagnose infections, but it also gives you an indication of where you need to treat. Because very often you would see that a patient had a LEDs before and they missed the lesion completely. 
because it's on the edge of the cervix or it was, it was not treated by the, the first procedure. So, um, and it's also important, obviously, at the time of treating the patient to, to exactly decide where to cut. So I'm going to end soon. I just want to show you a few slides. So this is a typical appearance of where we can diagnose an infection with candida of herpes. You can see the blisters there. The next thing that we need to say, is this a good candidate for colposcopy? Can we do a proper colposcopy? And that's where the term adequacy of the colposcopy comes in. Um, when you look at the cervix, we need to look at the transformation zone because that's where the cancer start. And to know that you're actually looking at the transformation zone, you need to see the squamous columnar junction, the entire 360 degree um, squamous columnar junction. People get very excited about squamous columnar junctions and um, they classify it into class 1, 2, and 3, and I'll show you a quick slide about that. If you can't see the entire squamous columnar junction, you've already seen the picture um, by Dr. Van der you can use the Kogan speculum to open up the endocervix a little bit. And importantly, menstruation is not a contraindication for colposcopy because then you will miss a lot of patients that come for an appointment and they're not ready. Why is it important to talk about the squamous columnar junction? Because many of the lesions will be easily visible on the ectocervix, but a significant number of lesions will be here in the, in the endocervical canal, a little bit higher up in the canal. So especially in older patients, you need to see a little bit into the canal, and you need to know if you see the entire transformation zone. So International Federation of Coposcopy and Cervical Pathology classifies the transformation zone into a type 1, type 2, and type 3. And type 1 basically is a young woman where you can see the entire transformation zone. It's out on the ectocervix, quite easy to see. Type 2 means it's partially visible, and type 3 means it's sort of creeping up into the canal. So for this patient, you'll need a Cogan speculum. And this will also determine a little bit how you're going to approach treatment. If you're going to do a LEDS procedure for a patient with a type 1 squamous columnar junction, you can go fairly shallow. And if you have a type 3 transformation zone, you probably need to go a little bit higher up, but then you can cut a smaller um, uh, cone on the, on the ectocervix. So Dr. Van der stole this picture from me, the next one. So this is the Cogan speculum. I've got a different face there. So if you want, you never know what you're going to find. So... Uh, <laughs> Um, so what features are we looking at when we want to decide is this something important or not? So the first thing you need to decide is this colposcopy adequate? Can you see the squamous columnar junction? Because that tells you, um, will I see all the lesions? Do I need to go a little bit higher up in the canal? Then the next thing is staining with acetic acid and iodine. Then we look at the margins of the lesion. We look at the topography, whether it's an ulcer or an exophytic lesion. Um, and also in the blood vessel pattern. So be, be careful with acetic acid. We've got a very good pharmacy in Tigerberg. All our bottles are labeled clearly 3 to 5 percent acetic acid. And it's on top of a brown bottle. There is another white label. But in private practice, I know about two cases where there was medical legal action where the acetic acid that was supplied to the doctor was actually industrial strength, almost 100% acetic acid, and then you get vaginal burns. So my practice is when I put the acetic acid into the bucky, I smell it, and you will smell the difference between a normal vinegar smell and sort of a, a strong acid. And I also let the patient smell it, and I say, we're going to put vinegar on your, on your cervix. So 3 to 5% acetic acid. The acid will then change the abnormal cells and will stain the abnormal cells white. And the time it takes for that development of the, of the whiteness is important. The longer it takes, the lower grade the lesion typically, the denser the white, the more high grade the lesion. Um, where it is, usually the, 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 the more central the lesions are, the higher grade they are. If they're on the periphery or on the vaginal walls, they're typically low grade. Um, and remember, if you see endocervix, that so sometimes can also stain white. Um, so low-grade lesions take a while to develop. 
wait for two minutes before you actually do um, your colposcopy. Um, high grade lesions will be more in the middle and this re rests on this principle that a lot of nuclear material um, reflects the light better. Um, so after application of acetic acid, the high grade lesion will reflect more light than a, than a low grade lesion. And this is quite a nice picture of uh, application of acetic acid. And you can see, um, if you use your imagination, I can see a lesion here on the posterior lip of the cervix. It is on the squamoculumna junction, so I would say this is probably a CIN2 maybe. Um, it's not, and the one at the top there is far away from the middle, but it's quite dense, so maybe also a CIN2 or 3. But acetic acid helps you a lot to determine the, um, this, the site and the severity of the lesion. Iodine is very useful, particularly to stain normal squamous epithelium. Normal squamous epithelium contains, especially in young people, a lot of um, glycogen, and that's what attracts the iodine. So this nice sort of lint, 70% brown color, means that the cells are normal. And if they're yellow, um, then we assume that they're abnormal. So you can get very different sort of patterns. You look at the borders of the lesion. This is a um, normal epithelium, the brown ectocervical epithelium. And then you can see a nice sort of clear border. Some people talk about the geographic border. That would be more in keeping with a high-grade lesion. Actually, if I look at this, I think this is probably not a low grade. This is a low grade lesion. Okay, so you, you can give us the, the final answer. Um, okay, so let me just go on to my next slide. So margins are important. So geographic and sharp borders are in favor of high grade lesion. How do you have it? Hmm. Uh, no, no, no. Geographic margins in favor of the low grade, low -grade lesion. lesion. Okay. No. Classification. Okay, so it does regard this first one, but the, th the third one is certainly true. If you see an, within a lesion a margin, then you're definitely worried about a high grade lesion. Th this is a picture that I like very much. This is one of my best colposcopy pictures. Um, and what you can see on this um, is normal um, ectocervical epithelium, nice and brown. Then probably a low-grade lesion, and you can see a map of Africa, so maybe this is a low-grade lesion. I made a mistake on the previous slide. And then if you look carefully, you might be able to see there's an internal border here. Um, and this lesion that we see at the, on the posterior lip is sort of exophytic a little bit. So I think in a background of a low-grade lesion, this is definitely here is a... Oh, you can't see my pointer, but you can see... Um, at the, on the posterior lip, um, a high-grade lesion and maybe even an infiltrating carcinoma. So blood vessels are important, but I'm going to leave that for Liana to show. Um, nor, you can see normal vessels, um, and the things that can catch you out is a Naboth follicle. Abnormal blood vessels are typically in the background of an acetyl-white lesion, but again, we'll leave that for later. And then topography is important. Like I said, this is an exophytic lesion. So, um, one thing to remember is a high-grade lesion is almost always close to the squamoculumna junction. It's often, it's often central, so if you're it's uncertain about where to take a biopsy, take it in the middle. Um, and if you're uncertain, take multiple biopsies and mark them and put them in different specimen pots. So what about treatment? If we use colposcopy to guide treatment, we must remember that the endocervical glands can go up to the depth of about seven millimeters underneath the cervix, uh, surface. So if you cut the leads, uh, leads um, go to at least about seven millimeters deep underneath the surface um, to make sure that you get all the sort of the, the deeper parts of the lesions. It's important to get the entire lesion out if you can, um, because if the margins are positive, if there are the, if there are lesions up to the point where you've cut 
then the chances of recurring intraepithelial neoplasia is quite high. Um, and we want to actually try and get all of those abnormal cells away. So in order for us to reduce cancer, we need to have proper cytology. We need the technical expertise and we need to do good corposcopy. Otherwise, we're just not going to be successful. And the UK NHS system works because they've got quality control at all the different steps, including colposcopy. So if we do colposcopy properly, we hopefully will be able to um, reduce um, the incident. So I want to play a little video clip. Um, if you look on this picture, you'll see the night sky. You can see Orion's belt there. Um, but a colposcope gives you an opportunity to look at look a little bit closer so if you if you had a mm, see a little bit more detail okay let's see so this is what a colposcope will do for you it will bring you in a little bit closer get a little bit more detail um, and then you can sometimes see very interesting uh, things Not a long video. So as your magnification increases, you can see things like this in nebula. Okay, so that's my bit. And if you just put in a speculum, you'll miss all the action on the cervix.